Welcome to the Pharmacist's Voice Podcast, Episode 255. I'm your host, Kim Newlove. Audavita founder and CEO David Wolf is my guest today. This is a great episode for authors and podcasters. I happen to be a pharmacist by training, and I know there are a lot of pharmacy professionals in my audience, so we're going to guide our discussion towards pharmacist authors and pharmacist podcasters. Audavita helps authors who want to narrate their own audiobooks from home, and they also offer what I call a concierge podcasting service. Before I tell you a little more about my guest, I just want to tell you real quick that the video version of this episode will also be on my YouTube channel. You can find my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash at symbol, The Pharmacist's Voice. Now for the introduction. David Wolf spent years serving as a music composer and producer of audio content for radio, TV, film, podcasts, audiobooks, and multimedia. He founded Audavita Studios in 2016 to apply his experience and the talents, skills, and expertise of his creative team to help companies, publishers, entrepreneurs, influencers, and thought leaders grow their brands and businesses with podcasts and audiobooks. As you may already know, I help pharmacy professionals plan podcasts, either with my self-paced online course, which you can find at kimnewlove.com, or through private consulting. I also coach pharmacist authors who want to narrate their own audiobooks. If you're interested in working with me with podcasting or audiobooks, please fill out the contact form on my website, which is thepharmacistvoice.com. I have been excited about this episode. David Wolf and his company, Audavita, have the solution that many of my podcasting clients need. Many of my podcasting clients do not want to cook up their own audio files. Audio files are MP3 files. You need to know audio engineering to make an MP3 file. I always tell my clients, you have four options for making an MP3 file. The MP3 file, again, is the audio file for a podcast. The four options are, number one, do it yourself. Number two, hire an editor. Number three, join a network like the Pharmacy Podcast Network with Todd Urey. Or number four, hire a concierge-type podcasting service like Audavita. Today, you'll learn more about Audavita and what a concierge-type podcasting service is. They can help you with your podcast if you don't want to do it yourself or hire an editor or join a network. All four options have pros and cons, but if you want to go with a company that can do it all for you, please connect with David Wolf after you hear how Audavita can help you. Also, if you're a pharmacist author and you want to narrate your own audiobook and you want to do it from the comfort of your own home, Audavita can help you with that too. This is a great company, amazing opportunities. You need to hear about this. Like I said, this is a great episode for authors and podcasters. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Audavita founder and CEO, David Wolf. Hi, David. Welcome to the Pharmacist Voice Podcast. How are you? I'm great, Kim. Thanks so much for having me. Great to see you. My pleasure. How is the world of Audavita treating you? Oh, my gosh. That's a great, like, high-level question. I'm a happy entrepreneur. Um, this project has been extremely gratifying on a lot of levels. I think I told you I had a, a couple of prior careers, one uh, generating creative work for big and small brands uh, all over the place, uh, doing uh, music composition and audio production. So uh, that business was a very different world than the one I now uh, lead and run. I've got an absolutely spectacular team of very kind-hearted um, people and, uh, you know, when you have a business like this, like-minded people that share values, it's a wonderful thing, but they think very differently than I do. So it's been a wonderful uh, experience. And I think that's been part of the most gratifying part of it. So that's the long way of saying everything's going well at Audavita. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. I'm glad to have you on the show because as a pharmacist who helps pharmacists plan podcasts, you could help my pharmacists because 
There are some of them that just don't want to learn how to record, edit, and produce audio. How can you help my pharmacists? Oh, how thank you for that. So um, we have a team approach, and pharmacists are involved with the work that they know and do. So we understand that phenomenon because we work with professionals from all walks of life, all kinds of sectors. Uh, and many of them are very technical, as is the pharmacist's world. You know, it's a very specific, specified, and, and we don't expect them to know how to record, edit, produce, distribute, how the podcasting works. So we have a very systematic approach to all of this. It starts with what we call the phase one, which is really designing the show. It's the listener experience. Sometimes it's the viewer experience if they'd like to do audio, uh, video as well as audio. Some of our clients do that. We have, incidentally, we have about 45 or 50 shows in production at our current size. So when you're like that, uh, when you have that many shows running in tandem, you have to have systems in place. So all of this makes it very easy for the pharmacist to uh, engage in the the, uh, the the planning of the show during this phase one that I just mentioned a moment ago. And then subsequently the episodes, the design, the arc of those shows, what how uh, how they should uh, go in terms of the listener experience, the guesting, who should they invite to be a guest on their show, if that's the model they're choosing to go with. Um, and um, of course, all the technical aspects of production which that's key to us taking it off of their plate so that really by the time they're recording it's really all about focusing on their guest on their content and relaxing into this process without having to worry about pressing record or how does it sound or uh, is everything under control and and then beyond all of that um so in the i think the broadest sense we're just taking the technology the logistics the planning off of uh, their plates so they can focus on the messages they want to deliver to their audience. I love what you do because there are so many pharmacists who tell me, I just want to step up to the mic. I don't want to do anything else. They want to have an idea in their mind about what they want to do. And I think that's why yeah. they come to me for the planning aspect, but yes. for you to help them execute, that is a huge weight lifted off of them. I'm so glad that companies like Audavita are out there. And not only do you produce podcasts, but I help pharmacist authors narrate their own audiobooks. Can you talk a little bit about what you do to help authors, whether they're pharmacists or not, but authors right. follow through on that audiobook component? I can absolutely do that. And by the way, I just want to retrace a little bit on the podcast thing. It's 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 so wonderful that you can help with the content, planning, the design of the show, and then toss it to us for execution. That's a beautiful way to think about our collaboration, Kim. So thank you for that. On the audiobook side, we produce, uh, we have a separate team. Some of our resources in our company are shared, but we have podcasts and audiobooks, as you mentioned. We produce about 200 audiobooks a year, and we work directly with authors like those that you work with. We also work with publishing services providers that help self-publish authors get the book written and out to market. And then we also work with some yeah, medium-sized publishers, not, not the big, big ones, but the medium-sized publishers that don't have an audio department in-house. And so we help really become an augmentation of their team and help them provide audio for their uh, author clients. So the process for audiobooks is um, a bit different than uh, podcasts, although there are some things in common. The things in common are is uh, is that uh, you're uh, we are recording them remotely with a some one of our team there present. With the audiobooks, it's quite it takes really the shape of a coaching uh, session, like as if you were with a director in a play or a movie. But the the idea here is not to completely train the author client uh, to be a, a professional voiceover, but rather to deliver the most connective, authentic. Uh, sincere performance of their work that they can to the listener. So our producers are trained and uh, come into these recording sessions, which usually last about 90 minutes each. That's kind of a sweet spot for energy. And we can unpack any of these little aspects if you like. But um, in a series of 90 minute sessions, they're working with the author as they read, uh, get them relaxed and get them comfortable. You know, not all pharmacists or anyone uh, is all is used to being on a microphone. So many times we're, these are this is a new experience for them. 
Um, and I like to say that the process that we aim to deliver is as important as the product that they come out with at the very end, because this it's almost like media training. Uh, and, and it comes in handy um, in case they, they want to appear on other people's podcasts for any reason, or they're doing public speaking, or they're doing other things. This is valuable experience if they haven't done it on mic. So these 90-minute sessions are you're reading, reading, reading. Oops, we go back to a paragraph. We go back a sentence. We pick it up from there. And we just work our way through the book in those 90-minute sessions, uh, depending on the word count, which is really what drives uh, how many sessions it'll take, how long the final book will be, all of those sorts of things. We make it very easy, again, very much like the podcast situation. Uh, they're reading their manuscript from a PDF. Our producer is working with them interactively as their performance coach, marking the script on our end on a PDF, on a, a, a lap, a, either a laptop or a, 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 a Apple a, a book. Uh, and so um, uh, iPad, sorry, I lost the word. Um, and so... Uh, we're annotating the performance use take three. Uh, we redid this. We're underlining things so that those are brought to the attention of the editor as they're stitching these uh, performances together into a seamless chapter by chapter audiobook ready for delivery on Audible, Amazon, iTunes. And then there are about 52 other places they can be, Kim. So um, I'll pause there. There's a lot to unpack there, but uh, yeah. It's an ideal situation to have, number one, the audio editor or engineer, so to speak, but then also to have somebody directing you. Because I don't know if you've ever tried to narrate an audio book, David, but I have. And when you do it, you don't know when you're screwing up. You don't find out until afterwards when somebody right. says, all right, this is your list of pickups. But to be able to do that live is a huge advantage. What I'm picturing for Audivita's audiobook narration service is somebody, a pharmacist, having a director help them pick out the best room in their house to record it from, yes, yes, giving absolutely. them advice about microphone and microphone technique, and then also saying, all right, I want you to go ahead, start now, and then if there's a problem, stop pick up from the beginning of this paragraph. And then you guys are making the notes, like you said, on an iPad, on the manu manuscript. There are so many advantages that I just heard you talk about. Mm -hmm. I can't do all of that all at once. But as a team, the narrator and your Audivita team are working together seamlessly to put this together faster than I could do it, to be honest. And I just want to make sure that my listeners and viewers, because this will be on YouTube as well, know that this is an option. So if you only write one book in your whole entire life and you want to narrate it, Audivita is a fantastic option. So it takes the engineering off your plate, the directing, the producing, the distribution. I love what you're doing. Highly recommend to my narrators that I work with, for sure. Thank you, Kim. And um, I want to mention that when we, you mentioned microphones, so sometimes the equipment can be kind of a thing for people because it's not something they're work, used to dealing with or working with. So we actually drop ship when an author engages with us, we drop ship the gearbox. We call it the gearbox. It's the headphones and the microphone and the stand right to their doorstep. And then we have a pre-production meeting with our producer and the author to go through the setup. You mentioned briefly the acoustic environment in their home. Many people think in their heads, oh, I have to go to a studio to accomplish a high quality recording. That's just, it's a myth. It's not true, particularly for spoken word. I mean, if you're doing music and bands and orchestras and those sorts of things, yes, you need a, a, you know, a very particular kind of studio environment. But for spoken word, what we're looking for is a room in your home. It can be a walk-in closet where there's no reflectivity. There's no echo on the walls like you'd have. The extreme case would be your bathroom or your shower, right? Where everything's just kind of, you know, you sound good when you sing, but it's not good for recording because we want what we call an acoustically dry situation. So we've had situations where we put blankets in front of the microphone or a pillow around you, or you go into your bedroom because there's a lot of soft surfaces. You've got, um, you know, everything from bookshelves to, to carpets, to a bed, to drapes on the, you know, we try to find um, where there's minimal reflectivity, if you like. So that's something the producer will work on uh, as you're setting up the microphone during that pre-production meeting so that by the time your first session comes, everything's set up, you're ready to go. And as you said, it just becomes this, you've got a set of ears on the other end to really handhold you through reading each bit, each chapter in the cleanest possible way. Yes. And another advantage I just thought of 
it's more of a conversation with the person across from you instead of you reading this emotionlessly, possibly, because you're a naive to the process. But instead, you've got this person across from you and you feel like you're reading to somebody. Now, I have not gone through your process, but I can imagine it being very much like a podcast interview, except I'm reading, you know, some words on a page. Right. That's exactly right. So you're absolutely right. This this having someone on the receiving end of your read is very important, uh, particularly if there are stories or anecdotes that are part of your manuscript. But in any case, to know you've got a receiver, someone listening, and not to be nervous or feel like you're being criticized. We're just really there with a gentle touch to bring out the best performance in you. So um, I'm, I'm glad you put a box around that. That that interactivity is quite essential. I did want to also put a, a little neon sign around um podcasting from an audio production perspective and, and call it video as well is much more forgiving than audiobooks and the reason is is that the audiobook distribution ecosystem audible amazon apple and all of the other 52 or so that do this have very very specific audio specs sample rates and noise uh, floor requirements and all kinds of geeky audio stuff that uh, certainly a pharmacist probably wouldn't know unless they've been an audio engineer at any point in their life. And we, so what we're doing is we're really stripping away and we're providing an expertise. All of that has to go into the creation of the final product so that it'll be accepted by Audible, Amazon, Apple, and all of the rest, because they'll kick it back if it's not right. We've had a few instances where authors have come to us having tried to do it on their own, or maybe they've gone to a recording studio where the studio knew how to do music sessions and knew how to record a voice, but didn't really understand how to to do what we call the audio mastering, which is a critical last step to organizing and the file formats, the sample rate, the bit rate, all of those things are have to be just perfect. Otherwise, the distributors won't accept your title. And it can be very um, uh, frustrating if you've, you know, you're know you going through this repeating cycle of trying to get something submitted and it's being kicked back. And because you're not an audio professional, you don't really understand why. So we've had a few instances where we've got the source recordings and then they send them to us and we'll uh, you know, sort of charge a flat rate to just fix the files, if you like, and get them ready for distribution. So here we're baking all of that in. So you've got recording, editing, and then this post-production mastering stage which is so critical. Also, the artwork needs to be square, like it does for a podcast. And so that's another spec that we help accommodate for all of our authors. Meeting specifications is very important. You bring up such a good point. Yes, that's something that I don't think no offense to you pharmacists listening to this, but I don't think this is something that most pharmacists know how to do. Trusting a professional that knows what they're doing, it will cost you money, but they will get it done. They will get it done right. You will pass specifications. That is an important, important point for sure. Um, Going back to the podcasts. Yes. We were talking a little bit in the audiobook conversation just now about how yeah. it can help with performance to have somebody across yes. the screen, you know? Yes. So if somebody, a pharmacist, were having a solo podcast, not an interview, but a solo podcast where they're just talking as a thought leader about whatever their, yeah. their area of expertise is, yeah. it is so helpful to have somebody across the mic, so to speak, across the screen from you listening in. So it feels like a conversation. So it sounds like a conversation because A lot of people, pharmacists that I've talked to, say that it is very awkward pressing record and just talking. They mess up. They have to edit out mistakes. So having somebody across the mic on a podcast with Audavita would be super, super easy because it's like a conversation with somebody that's not participating in the recording. What are your thoughts on that? That's exactly right. I think you've you've telegraphed it well. Similarly to the audiobook experience where it could be a very soloistic endeavor without anyone there and you'd be, you know, a lonely in a room hoping it's working. Uh, Having someone on that receiving end, if you don't have a guest and you are doing monologue uh, minisodes or full length episodes of lecture type of situation, talking to your audience, sort of breaking the fourth wall, the fourth wall now becomes our producer who's there listening with ears. Hey, you may want, Kim, you may want to go back and just get that. That little section, I heard you trip over something or it didn't feel like you were connecting and you weren't engaged. You know, it's all about engagement and connecting with podcasting. So, and tr- truthfully for audiobooks as well, remember that all of this, this sort of uh, 
speaking in a microphone and someone with someone receiving it either on YouTube if it's video or uh, very often it's audio only. It's a very intimate kind of connection you're making with a listener. It's one to one. It's not one to many as if you were uh, like a keynote speaker. It's a different thing. You're not working a room. You're just really connecting with one listener at a time. So having one producer there with you simulates that and it really brings and so we're we're all about bringing that out of the uh the podcaster or the audiobook narrator but but it's true that um people change their modality uh sometimes when they're alone or they're reading so part of what we're looking for is to make it feel more natural and you mentioned conversational so that you are making that emotional connection which is really where people start uh, i love the way you frame that and it's perfect it's you have a good understanding of what we do I do. That's why I'm referring people to you. <laughs> I love what you do for two mm-hmm. reasons, the podcasting and the audiobooks. Pharmacists are not into audio production, but pharmacists do write books and they would right. like to narrate them. And they get hung up on that whole, oh, I've got to buy recording software and learn how right. to use it. And right. I've got to buy right. a microphone and a stand right. and right. spend all this time. And they end up failing because pharmacists, I know pharmacists, we are very perfectionistic because we spend a lot of years not killing people with medicine. Right. Therefore, we we take that and we translate it to so many other things that we do. I meet right. a lot of pharmacists who say, I'm just going to buy all the equipment and do it myself. Well, they try that. They fail. They come to me and I tell them, go hire that recording studio or whatnot. But yeah. you offer a solution that allows them to be in their own home, basically borrow equipment so there's no buying it. There's no recording software when it comes to you because you're doing that on your end. You make it so easy. And a lot of pharmacists, I don't want to say that we have disposable income, but we have good paying jobs. And if we want this done, we will pay for it. And that is something that you offer a free consultation about, right? The cost of it. Would you like to talk about the the consultations that you offer on your website? Thank you very much. Yes. So we are absolutely uh, happy to meet with any author or potential podcaster that's interested in learning a little bit more, unpacking some of the logistics about how all of this works. We've covered a lot of it here. Um, by the way, I just want to mention that we, we don't loan the microphone and equipment. We do actually drop ship it, and it's yours. It's it's baked into the budget, and then you and then your author or podcaster pharmacist has that. Should they be a guest like I am today on a podcast with someone else, they'll have good equipment. They'll always have it. If they write a subsequent book, they'll already be set up. They'll know what to do, and it's very easy. It just plugs right in, and our producer guides them through the setup. There are some you know each software and platform has slightly different. Um, I should mention that we don't use Zoom or Skype or Google Meet or any of those sorts of devices to record high quality audio. We use specialized software. It feels a lot like a Zoom call. It feels a lot like these so-called conferencing environments where there is video and you can see each other, but it's recording high quality audio, invisible to you, but we're remote controlling it and it's recording it on your computer, on the client side computer, if you like. So I just wanted to make those two clarifications, one about the equipment and also about how how does this happen with recording because that's maybe a little mystery that people are wondering well how do you do that um so did i cover it let's see what else uh the consultations they just go to autovita.com yes yes they can go to autovita.com there is a contact us page um i can provide uh an email uh for or, or link rather for calendly scheduling for this sort of consultative call where we just talk you through basically covering a lot of the points in a deeper way, more individually uh, for each author. Um, You know, we're very fluid about scheduling. We have capacity to be able to onboard people for both podcasting and audiobooks pretty much right away. It takes about four weeks to set up a podcast and get it ready to launch. We like to get four episodes minimally in the can before you launch, particularly if it's a weekly, so that you're never behind and, you know, chasing deadline schedules, which is stressful. Um, audiobooks, we can, we've had authors that do more than one session in a day because they just want to get it done quickly, or, uh, they'll stretch it out over a few weeks, depending on the length of the book. So we're very fluid and flexible. It's much like scheduling a zoom call when you're uh, scheduling recording sessions with our producers, but we're happy to meet with you and talk you through all of this stuff. Uh, absolutely. I've had a really good experience just talking with you just to get information for my my audiobook clients and my podcasting clients. So I would highly recommend you guys. I think you're just the top. You guys are awesome. 
Thank you, Kim. Appreciate that. Yep, you're you're great. I would like to, at this point, ask you some questions. So I have this podcast planning, uh, kind of a, like a f- workflow in my yes. online course, my podcast planning course for pharmacy professionals. Perfect. I know that you have an equivalent for what you do there at Audavita. So yes. I'm just going to go ahead and start with question number one. I, it goes through question number 11. Okay. Number one, how do you help podcasters establish their why? When we're in phase one, one of the first things we talk about in the design of the show is why are you choosing podcasting? I like to think of podcasting as it's an extension of your, really your content marketing. It is a function of marketing, a subset of marketing. So it's clear if you're clear and you have clarity about why are you doing this? So it starts with a question and we have that discussion and all of this informs the flow of the show. I know you've got 11 questions and I may tend to go on a bit. So I'll, I'll try to keep them shorter answers, but the why feeds feeds everything else that follows it because then you truly believe in what you're doing and it helps you design the so-called sort of the schedule of curriculum or content over the arc of 10 episodes or if it's an always on podcast you, you've always you know what that arc of the listener or viewer experience should be I love that you said it's in phase one of what you do you have two phases yes. it's right yes. up front in phase one that's, That's awesome. right. Yes. This launch phase and then the episodic production, which is really the execution of all the recordings, but you've got a plan. And part of that planning is, is the why factor. So I love that. Definitely. You would recommend planning before launching too, I'm sure. Right? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. In every sense of the way. Some people do that fire ready aim thing. It's this podcasting should not be like that. <laughs> plan before you launch. <laughs> I like that. Yes. Perfect. Number two. All right. In my process, after we establish the why, we talk about how you're going to get started. You at Autovita, I'm sure have a different how to get started than I recommend because I do the do-it-yourself phase, right? You're, right, right. you're figuring out who am I going to listen to, you know, all the, all the beginning choices. Right, right. How do you get your podcasters started? I think you mentioned phase one. So phase one encompasses a lot of things which are probably folding into these first few questions I'm guessing you have. So there's the why you're doing it and really formulating. I mean, some folks come to us and they really do already know what their why is, but if there's a question mark about that or they're not sure formatically what they should be doing, then the why is what we tackle. Um, To your question number two, the how is really we move into the steps of getting it done. So Erica Yoakum, who's on our team, she's our COO, she'll send what we like to affectionately call the fire hose email, which is a request for a bunch of things, which really, again, helps crystallize, consolidate, and clarify a lot for the podcaster because they're essentially questions. Artwork, what would you like your brand to look like for the show? Uh, do you have logos? Art? Do you, do you have logo art? Do you have a, a branding Bible already created that you used for your website? Do you have a website that we can use color palettes from? Um, would you like us to uh, create the logo? We've done that as well. Do you want to include your headshot? Do you want to have for the photo, for the, uh, the album art, you can have one series graphic, which is required, but you can also, each episode can have a graphic that features your guest, if that's the format using. So all of these questions about uh, the, 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 the execution of artwork, the intro and the outro to the show is next. So these are what I'll call the tangible assets that come out of phase one that really helps set that listener or viewer up. So if it's video, there might be a logo that's moving and then you'll hear an announcer come in and say, welcome to Kim's show. It's called this. Here's why. Uh, make a listener promise or a viewer promise. Here's what you can expect. And we design a short script, not too long, but just a short script to bring the host in, set the listener up. There's some music. If that's desired we often have voice professional voiceover music introducing you the host the pharmacist so that it separates you and really puts you it's like being on a stage being introduced right Uh, in a podcast format so all of these assets the intro the outro which we call the show liners are also created during phase one then scheduling so we have what we call a, a podcast planning scheduler which is very systematic your pharmacist will love this uh who's on the show what's the title What's the uh, show notes? I'll get to that in a moment. And um, basically a description of what happened on that episode. And then the release date. So we're very systematic about recording, editing, 
and when they're released. You don't have to record in the same rhythm or cadence that you release. So all of those things are worked out using this podcast planning um, spreadsheet. I want to uh, um, unpack that point uh, we were just talking about. Each episode requires, well, let me back up one. One of the things that Erica will request is the, uh, the, the the description of the podcast series, which goes along with the distribution. If you go out to iTunes or in any, any of the other platforms, Spotify, you'll see there's a show uh, description that basically does exactly that. It describes what you can expect on this series of shows. And then separately from that, every time you record a new episode, it needs a title, ideally a keyword searchable type of title so that it's readily available if someone's searching for this subject matter and you know not don't try to be too clever and we'll help guide a lot of this and then um um what the show notes which we can do if uh there's a slight extra fee and we'll do that for the podcaster a lot of our podcasters like to write their own show notes because they're with they were there they know what it is and it can be as short as a couple of sentences it can be longer. Sometimes folks like to create bullet points with timestamps. There's different ways to do show notes. Um, and so we we cover all of that during phase one, kind of setting the stage so that once we're into episodic production, that routine is set. And all of that can go into the podcast planner, title, show notes, guest name, release date. So um, those are a lot of the hows. I know you've still got 10 questions left. So, uh, But we covered all of this in our pre-planning phase one stuff. And um, and then once the stage is set and these systems are in place, then you're just following the, the systematic approach. So, Yeah. You talked about a lot of what I do in my podcast planning course in the phase one, the fire hose email part yeah, of yeah. your your planning. So yeah. What I do is different from you, but some of my students will watch this and the ones that don't want to record, edit and produce their audio right. are going to have all of their homework done and come to you and have all these decisions made and be able to plug in their answers very easily to this fire hose email. So Wonderful. I'm, yeah, it's like we're complementing yeah. what one another does. So I am a very good referral source for your future clients because I'm Wonderful. setting them up with what they need to know. Or if they decide, exactly. you know what, Kim, I, I went with your podcast planning course and you know what, I don't really understand it the way you're explaining it. Maybe they would do better with you. I hate to say that, but. Sure. Sure. I mean, the thing with us. I'm not is, the only person in the game. No, I love that, Kim. And, you know, look, and everyone processes information slightly differently, even though uh, we've identified that, you know, you, you, the people that do pharmacy work are they, they have a, a certain way of thinking which qualifies them to do that work. And so you're probably very effective at helping them. But it, it also there's a there's a difference certainly between the doing of it, which is what we do. We actually do and execute uh, and the learning how it's going to be in a future way. So so some people are more experiential in learning. And so we're really holding their hand through all of these steps. So it's a very complimentary situation, as you described. You're prepping them and then they move into action mode with us. So that's great. Right. Yeah. Yes. They're executing on your side of things. Yeah. We do compliment each other. And I appreciate that about you because I really understand Likewise. what you're doing. And yeah. I really think that my clients will become your clients if they don't want to record, edit, and produce their podcasts themselves. And that's okay. I want people to understand it's okay to farm that out, to go right. ahead and, right. you know, find somebody who's Zone of genius is that execution, and that is you guys for sure. Thank you so much, and I love the way you say all this. By the way, uh, farm it out. I think you should trademark that. A P H A R M it out. Yeah, right. I like that. <laughs> I should farm it out. I like that. Thank you. Now, a lot of these questions that I'm about to talk to you about are yeah. the things that you have already covered. But they, again, cool. this is my process, and we're talking about how you do it on your side. Right. So Perfect. number three, this is a question I get all the time. How long does it take to go from idea to published? So when it comes to Audavita, what do you think it on the what podcast side? Yes, the timeline absolutely. would be. Usually it's a four week process on phase one. That's really you what you're describing is how long does it take from the first meeting we have? We're engaged, we get a deposit for phase one, and now we're meeting. A, a few times to get everything planned. Some of it's asynchronous uh, by, by a series of emails and other types of communication. Uh, it, it's usually a four week process. And that four weeks can include beginning to record episodes so that we get that four in the can before we have a launch date. But I figure about a four week process, about a month. 
they can vary, but that's a good number. Okay, that's great that you know that. I, this is your business, so I'm I'm sure you're very familiar with your numbers. Now that somebody, let's say, would be in your system, they've gone through yeah. phase one, they're on episode number five. How long does it take to go from stepping up to the mic and recording until that one's published? It's a seven day turnaround. Per I think what you're asking is the per episode turnaround. It can happen sooner, but our um, your pharmacist, our client, your client, um, schedule a session, and then we no more than seven days, they'll have a final episode ready for release. So that gives you a sense of lead time. It can happen sooner. We have a team of editors. And typically when we get into engagement with a particular client, we assign the same editor to do that show all the time. So they start to get the workflow and the the the, the, the listening flow and the, the experience of the of the host. Um, and recording, uh, our recording engineers are also often, our folks like to use the same person. It's not always necessary and possible. All of our folks are great. They meet you on the session set up sounds good guest sounds good okay i'm rolling and now you record typically you're booking about an hour's worth of time to get a single episode you know usually it's a 20 to 30 minute episode that's what we recommend that's the sweet spot not too long not too short it's just right they some of our clients do um design shorter shows mini sods or you know we have one client that does uh, a long form every week and then does mini sods like five minute little lectures in between his interviews which are longer form so um you know all of this happens in phase when we figure that out but um figure a week turnaround on a normal 30 minute ish type of episode and and in that week we'll send you a, a draft of how's this our client the podcaster might say well at 30 uh three minutes and 27 seconds until three minutes and 46 seconds i said this and let's take that out it's not relevant or it didn't flow or whatever the or the guest said something that you want to remove usually it's a subtractive editing process final approval good to go. Then we schedule it for release and the show notes have to be ready. The title has to be ready. It's all in the podcast planner. My team grabs all that and sets it up for publishing on the published date. So figure seven days. That was your, your actual question was how long, but of course I elaborated because that's me. No, that's okay. You're demonstrating your value in talking about this as well, because for me to have a 30 minute podcast episode that is solo and I don't have to worry about the interview. Yeah. It will take me as long as it took me to, you know, record that to listen to all of the playback. So if it's 30 right. minutes unedited, I have to listen to 30 minutes of playback and maybe I'll eliminate three or four minutes. So I've then spent at least 60 minutes on a 30 minute episode. And as somebody who has to do it herself, I now have to write show notes, the title. I have to come up with artwork. I have to upload everything. You just make it possible for them to show up for 30 minutes. And then That's listen right. to the playback after right. you have edited it. And then they get to give That's the right. final thumbs up. So I love that because you're basically telling my pharmacist clients they can plan to spend 30 minutes, you know, once recording it, 30 minutes listening to the playback, maybe if it's even 30 minutes. Yeah. Yep. All they have to do is give a thumbs up and they save all that time not having to do all that other stuff themselves. That's awesome. Right. That's true, Kim. If you're not an audio editor, it can take up to 4x, four times the actual running time of a show to do the edit, get it packaged, get it set up, upload it for, you know, and we, we, and we do this every day for 45 or 50 shows. So it's very, yes, we take all of that off your plate. That's exactly what we're paid to do. Yes, it, that is a huge value. I would love for Thank somebody you. to edit my stuff, but I'm not willing to pay for it. <laughs> but for anybody well, who's that. just and, I, and you bring in an interesting point. So we do, we're very customized over here. So let's just say we have someone that does want to, they have some budgetary constraints or concerns about that. Uh, they want to come in lightly. So a couple options. One is that they can release every other week instead of every week. So that can, you know, cut the budget in half essentially for the episodic production part of that. And then we also have um, of their endeavor. Then we also have the option. Some of our podcasters are capable and comfortable pressing record themselves and doing the recording part of the operation without us. And then we're just doing the post-production. It's a little tricky if you haven't done it before, but we can help the podcaster get set up and make sure they know what they're doing and they know what we need in order to deliver them a final show. And they carve out this, this a little bit of cost. It's not huge, but it, it, it helps minimize the budget outlay 
particularly if they're getting started. And sometimes they transition to, okay, now I'm I'm getting the groove. I know how this works. I want you guys to just uh, do that. I want you to be there for the recordings because I think I'll get a better recording if you're there. And I've got another set of ears and eyes looking at it and listening to it. So uh, it's a quality control thing. It's always better if we're there from front to back, recording, editing, post-production, distribute. But if budget is a constraint, some of our clients do self-record and send us the source files that then we can put, we continue with the rest of the process. So I did want to mention there's a, so there are options around. That's why my pharmacist clients need to book a 30 minute consultation with mm -hmm. you so they can talk about what they want to pay for and what they want to do for themselves. Yeah. Perfect. You bring yes. up a good point. Perfect. They're going to have questions that we may not cover here in their own way of thinking of things. So that's perfect. Yeah. And you could get them started off doing all the recordings with you. And then maybe they'll say, you know what? I got this. I'm going to record right. it myself. Right. And it then can work the other way. That's you exactly can right. You renegotiate the contract, right? That's exactly right. Absolutely. There's no long-term anything with us where, you know, there's this front end, which is relatively more expensive, but it's the phase one planning. And then from there, it's really a la carte. We're just billing for the podcast episodes that we actually post and we bill in the rears each month. So just in terms of understanding the economic model, that's how uh, that all those things are possible. Yes. All right. Great points. Let's move on. We talked Next. about how long it takes to get an episode out. Yeah. Number four, tools and gear needed and learning how to use everything. Do you guys talk about that during phase oh, yeah. one, phase two? Absolutely. So if some of our clients coming in have a microphone set up, it's usually a set of something to listen something to uh, record their their voice and then a stand here I'm using a boom stand so it gets it off of the floor right so a boom mic stand just you've probably seen them around you can also get a desk stand and then typically we're drop shipping or recommending if if so um we we price in about 250 dollars today uh, as of this recording to drop ship the recommended microphone stand and headset it's closed ear headset not like i'm wearing here and what that enables is the podcaster can hear themselves in the queue they can actually hear their own voice which is very helpful so yes large uh, high level we go through the equipment setup it's pretty minimal unpack it with our producer make sure it's all works we plug it in here's how it connects sometimes there's some system settings if you're on a microsoft based os or if you're on an apple systems vary all our producers are very used to that um on the guest side we're not shipping microphones to podcast guests but you probably know from your experience most of the microphones that are built into laptops and computers that kind of come with it are pretty good they're particularly the macs uh they're not what we feel is good enough for the host of the show, but for the guest of the show, absolutely. And we have a lot of ways from a signal processing way. I'm getting a little technical here audio wise, but we can clean up the audio and make it sound better. We can level if like the volumes are different. All of those things are the things our audio engineers know how to do both on the recording end. We want to optimize that. And then if it still needs a little work, we can do a little bit more work in post-production. So by the time you're listening back for approval, it sounds a lot better than probably it sounded when you actually recorded, but we go through all of that pre-production setup. Absolutely. So, um, and it's really plug and play. It's a USB mic that plugs right into your, you know, you don't need a mixer. You don't need any of those other sorts of things that sometimes people lunge into this process thinking they need to, you know, spend a couple thousand dollars on equipment. Uh, not necessary. You know, it's again, it's 250 if we drop ship it. And it's a little bit less if you just went on Amazon and bought stuff that we recommend, which is also possible. Thank you for talking about that, because a lot of people talk about starting a podcast and they get all excited about the tools and gear. And I think they overbuy what right. they think they need. And to have somebody on the other end who's saying, nope, this is all you need. You just need this microphone. Let's uh, right. you know, just go pretty basic and we'll teach you how to use it. That provides a lot of value. I just want to point that out because people who come to me often need a mic check so that they understand that their microphone is talking to their computer. And then when they get their recording software in, you have to make sure the microphone's talking to the recording software. It's, you know, it's not yeah, as easy there's as there's some just connection that has, That's exactly right. There's some connection software wise that has to happen to make sure you have the right microphone assigned to the software that's actually doing the recording, as opposed to, you know, you can have the microphone there, but if it's not assigned to the recording software with us and our engineer will instantly know that, oh, it's actually, you're using your ambient microphone. No, we need to switch the input, things like that. We go through that every time we record with someone. 
you guys flatten the learning curve completely. And I just want to say, I appreciate that. Thank totally. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's move on. Yeah. Number five, I talk about research and reflection needed to develop content. What yeah. I teach is that more preparation is less editing. So whether you're doing a solo show or an interview show, if you've researched your guest or you've written an outline of the order in which you want to talk about stuff, you're saving yourself time. What does Audavita teach about that in any of the phases that you help your podcasters with? It's a real dynamic thing, the the way they host, the way, you know, some podcasters tend to like to flow a little bit more and be more conversational. Others are more structured. When I was doing my own show, I was much more structured. I'd have, you know, five questions for a 30-minute episode, and I would just click through them. Sometimes I'd spontaneously use a follow-up. So there are different techniques to the so-called interview or conversational style, depending on the nature of the subject matter. And how you want that dynamic to flow. I also had guests when I was doing my own show, and this is, I think, reflective of what we recommend, where uh, the guest, you can ask the guest, what are the talking points they would want to bring and then reverse engineer your questions to follow a flow that they may prescribe so that you're really leaning into their knowledge mostly. You're not making assumptions about what questions they would respond to. Um, the other thing I'll say about a couple of things, when you're uh, interview, when you're uh, introducing a guest, the, uh, there's a tendency to read the whole biography sometimes with some podcasters that are a little bit green or they're a little inexperienced. They think they, they want the podcast guest to feel really good about themselves coming on. But reading a long laundry list of every accomplishment is not necessarily the most engaging way to bring the guest in. What I like to recommend is just a few reasons why this interview, this conversation is really going to benefit the listener. Here's why you want to talk, you want to listen to Kim and my interview with Kim, because we unpack this, we unpack that, we unpack this. Even to the extent that we've had, we have some clients that do the, the interview first and then they record the intro of the show after the interview is done retrospectively I so do that, that they really capture it. Yeah, you do that. Okay. So yes. So there's different ways to do it. And it just depends on the time, you know, commitment that the podcaster is willing to make, how um, specific they are about how they want that flow to be. So there's no one right way. It's a very dynamic kind of conversation that we like to recommend. It sounds like some coaching on how to run yes. a really well done episode is included in what you do. Yes, yes. That phase one Love covers that. a lot of it. And if they need additional help along the way, like they need feedback, listen to a show, see how it's going. Absolutely. Um, that That's all baked into what we do. We are here to be your partner to make sure the show is connecting with your audience and the, uh, the highest possible value for the listener. I love that you're focused on the listener. I am also focused on the listener. Podcasting is all about the listener and the listener yeah. getting something out of it. I love that, yeah. that you're Perfect. on the same page. Perfect. All right. Let's talk about writing. You talked earlier about titles, descriptions, blog posts, or website content, the show notes. Mm -hmm. So what, what can you do for the podcasters? Do you write the titles for them? Is that on them? Is it We recommend, choice? so great question. So coming out of the gate, we recommend, here's what we recommend for titles that work the best, the SEO, not to try to, not trying too hard, just get to the point that people will search for this content. The show notes is more of a variable. Some of our hosts like to just pen them themselves. We have several clients for whom we pull a transcript of the show, and then we, we from the transcript, we use AI as an assist, and we actually create the show notes for them. So those are kind of two extremes. Um, before AI, we used to hire writers and actually bring them in on occasion to actually do the show notes writing. But I think most what we've learned is most of our podcasters... Um, the show notes don't have to be long because people are there to listen. They're really not there to read a long synopsis. So uh, we have found these AI tools that we use to be very helpful. And we just charge a little bit to kind of do the pull the transcription and then generate show notes of a certain length that we know will achieve what it is uh, the podcaster wants, ideally. Some of the distribution platforms don't even pick up all of the show notes. They have constraints, different length constraints. So better to make them shorter and concise. It may include a link to the guest's website or something like that. Uh, all of those things are, are possible. So again, a lot of this is all covered in this phase one, how best to approach it. And then we a la carte it. If it's something they want to um, farm out to us, P-H-A-R-M, then we'll take it on and we'll charge them incrementally per episode. And it just drives a little bit of the cost up a bit, just a bit. 
I like what you're talking about. It's an additional service that you provide. It's a la carte. Mm -hmm. And the experience that you have with knowing that some of those podcast platforms will limit the number of characters that you can put in the show notes. That is very handy because I don't know about you, but when I first started podcasting, my show notes were long. And now that I know Apple Podcasts, for example, cuts you off after, I don't know if it's 400 characters or something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't make it that long anymore. (laughs) Or I put a separate post on my website, which is an option as well. If you want the SEO, if you want the Google juice, right? Absolutely. Drive some traffic to your website. Absolutely. And you bring up a point. Well, I know you have more questions and we're going to have time constraints. So go ahead. Let's move to your questions. The rest I can cover on an individual basis when folks call. Okay. I'll make these last few quick. The seventh thing on my list is about creating MP3 files. I don't teach people how to record, edit, and produce audio. I tell them you can either learn how to do it yourself, you can hire an editor, or you can go to David Wolf over at Audivita and you can have him produce your episodes for you. I think that you would just say, hire me. You know, that's probably your response. But that would would be the response. Yeah, that would be the response. I mean, again, podcast files are delivered like audiobooks in MP3 form. It's a compressed audio file format. We do a bunch of mastering to make it sound as good as it can, leveling, this, that, uh, bit rate, all of the technical jazz that pharmacists probably don't want to know about unless they're uh, exceedingly curious. So, yeah. Yeah, it's specs. It's meeting specs. You want to make sure that it sounds good. And That's exactly yeah, it's those right. MP3 files. All right, moving on to number eight, artwork. What does Audavita do for podcasters in the form of artwork? I think you so kind are, of covered is, it at first. Yeah, we did cover some of this. So there's two sort of layers to the answer. One is this is all phase one stuff. There's a There's a master branded artwork for the series that can carry through the whole series and that's it. Or We can price in creating a new, what I'll call episode specific artwork as the episodes are released where the host is is included and then the name of the guest is also. And what's nice about doing that, it costs a little more, but what's nice about that is it uh, inspires your guest to post their appearance on your show, which helps drive audience development, which is not something we have time to talk about today, but we can talk about that uh, on a subsequent episode uh, on this podcast, or I can do it on, we can do it on an individual basis with our team as we're into phase one. Thanks for the offer. Uh, I appreciate that you do both the, I guess you would say the whole entire podcast artwork and then the episode artwork, because there are some people that would like that and they don't want to do it themselves. And you guys offer that. Exactly. Moving on to number nine, podcast hosting platforms. How do you help pharmacists with, with podcasts if they want to put them on a podcast hosting platform instead of a YouTube podcast? All right. So most of our podcasts are always released on an audio hosting platform. YouTube is something that the client would handle on their own. We can assist with that. We have a couple of clients where we actually do the uploading, but we prefer to just ship the video version of the show to the client and let them access their own YouTube So outside of YouTube, we use a podcast hosting platform. Uh, We have a partnership and also the ability to bring in advertisers when certain audience thresholds are met and sizes of audiences, but uh, it's called Red Circle. You can go into Red Circle and have your own account. But when we do packages with our podcasters, we're handling all of that. So once the audio is approved, uh, you know, you get the video. So the audio side, we're handling all of the release, the scheduling of it, and it goes out to all of the major platforms, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Pandora, et cetera. So um, that's just something we do, and it's baked in, it's priced in to our model. We It just helps the podcaster control the, fl- the workflow and be assured that it's going out and there aren't any blips about all of that. I love that you upload all that for your podcasters because it's just one more step. It takes me maybe, you know, 10 to 20 minutes to do that. You got to have the title, the description, the artwork, all the things. So that's nice. You take that off your podcaster's hands. All right. We're just about done. Um, Podcast websites. Do you help your podcasters with their websites at all? We can outsource uh, if we're not website designers or and we're not really a marketing agency or a website design firm per se, but we do have partners that do that work. So if they don't have a website and it's something they need, we can bring in one of our partners to consult uh, early stage. And, you know, so because they do want to have this room and this is a subset of everything they're doing. And the website is quite essential to their brand for the podcast. So our package comes with a player, two options. Each episode can have its own 
sort of uh, embed code where we're sending it out every time we release and the podcaster would or their webmaster or whoever's managing their website would cut and paste the code into the page that's allocated or you know, uh, created for the podcast uh, episodes. Um, or we can give them one player where automatically each time they drop a new episode, all of the episodes appear within they can be scrolled through, which is a lot easier because you don't have to cut and paste every time you're doing stuff. So most of our podcasters, I think today they're they're taking that composite. Here are all the podcast episodes we've ever done. They can scroll through users that go to their website can scroll through to find the episode they're most interested in. Um, also to note, a website for the podcast comes with the package when you work with us. So outside of their own website on their domain, we have on our hosting platform a dedicated website. It's it, you can't customize it as much as you would your own site, but it has all the episodes. It has the player. It has the show description. It has um, really everything, and and that's a destination that they can send people to, or they can send them to Spotify or iHeart or wherever they'd like. So there are options in terms of where you're driving people to subscribe or listen and consume the, the content, and we work through all of that in phase one. It sounds like support for websites is available and yes. that is important. That's what my pharmacists need to hear. Yes. I appreciate yes. that. Yes. And then as far as advertising, do you help pharmacists or do you help your clients with advertising on social media or any other um, newsletters, anything like that? We do produce shorts. So short video clips or short well, usually they're video, like shorts that would run on YouTube, for example, or Instagram, or even TikTok. We, because we're a production company, we have video editors. We're able to produce those assets. Um, we, if if a client wanted someone to help manage their social media account, that's not something we do in house, but we do have partners that can do that for them. And if that's something they needed, we could certainly make. Are, you know, make referrals around that. But but the, 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 if um, to know that we can produce the extracted shorter versions to in order to promote and drive audience online on their platforms, yes, we can produce those assets. And it's just a matter of who's going to post them. Uh, so again, we can unpack that during phase one and put a plan together. Do you also help your clients include the content from their podcast episodes into newsletters? Yes, it's really by way of a, of a link. So we're not a newsletter. Again, we're not a marketing firm. So if they have a newsletter, we can provide them with a link to the show. Uh, and it's something that they can easily grab as well. But again, these are all sort of workflow types of things that we can suss out. But we do recommend that if you're shooting out a newsletter, you absolutely want to announce your latest episode to your newsletter recipients, right? It's just, again, to just drive that traffic and get that weekly momentum that you want. David, thank you so much for answering all 11 of those questions. We made it. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's great to, great to be with you, Kim. And this is a lot of fun. Yep. I love talking about this stuff, as you can probably tell. So. Oh, you're so experienced. You know your craft for sure. Yes. I would trust my pharmacist clients with you. So that is my thank endorsement you. for sure. Audavita is great. I don't Thank use you. them personally, but I would highly recommend them to. So you might think of us as listeners. a podcast prescription. This Sorry, is a prescription, I yes. I couldn't help for it. executing a podcast. Absolutely. <laughs> that is so clever. Love it. David, as we start to wrap this up, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Well, I we've covered a lot of ground here. Um, and I know we both have time constraints today. I'm happy to meet with anyone who uh, would like to meet. Uh, Kim, you have our contact information. We have a discovery uh, scheduling link, myself or Jay Spang, where we, you can think of us as interchangeable. He can talk just as fluidly about what we do as I do. Jay's been, I've known Jay for 20 years as he's been with me for five and he's a wonderful producer and uh, really helps us with uh, our client services side of what we do. So that scheduling link, and I'll make sure you have that. It's like a discovery call. And that's the first step to get started. And just to talk about the vision for a show. Um, I think that's probably the best place to leave people. Nothing more. I think we've covered a lot of ground and I really appreciate the time with you today. Well, thank you. I appreciate you being here on the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Take care. Thank you. All right. Be well. I'd like to share some final thoughts with you. First of all, if you're an author or a podcaster and Audavita sounds like a good fit for you, schedule a discovery call with them today. There's a link in the show notes. Second, this is a disclaimer. 
I am not an affiliate for Audavita at this time, and I am not compensated in any way for the contents of this episode. I am coming from a place of service, putting this out there. When I started working with pharmacist podcasters a few years ago, I was looking for a company that I could refer my clients to if they wanted a full-service solution for their podcasting needs. As I've gotten to know David Wolf and Jay Spang at Audavita, I feel confident that Audavita is going to take good care of my referred clients. I only help pharmacists plan podcasts, and I consult with them after they have a plan. I don't record for my clients or with my clients like Audavita does. I don't edit for my clients. I don't write titles, descriptions, or show notes. I don't create artwork, and I don't upload my clients' stuff to their podcast hosting platform. Audavita is who you want if you want to do all that with one company. My third and final point is that podcasting is about more than just hitting record, saying the first thing that comes to mind, and then pressing stop. If you want help planning your podcast, I can help. Audavita can help too. But if you want someone else to take care of your audio files and carry your episodes over the finish line, Audavita is a great option. That wraps up my final thoughts. Thank you for joining me for episode 255 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. You can find the show notes for this episode on thepharmacistvoice.com. Click on that podcast tab and then find episode 255. In the show notes, you'll find a link to Audavita's website, the discovery call link for Audavita, David Wolf's bio, a link to my self-paced online course for pharmacy professionals, and more. If you know someone who wants to start a podcast or narrate an audiobook, please share this episode with them. And if you like this podcast, please subscribe to or follow the Pharmacist's Voice podcast on your favorite podcast player and YouTube to get each new episode right when it comes out. Thanks for listening today. I'll talk to you next Friday.